Good evening, everyone. We might start. There are still a few people trying to park, but I think they'll probably get here before Julian starts. It's actually lovely to see you all here. We've got over 100 people in the cathedral so far, so that's lovely. We appreciated your wonderful support for the exceptional special interest morning with David Benny that a lot of you came to. And we're excited about our first face-to-face -face lecture for 200, 2021 with Julian Vickers-Seth, whom I'm going to introduce in a moment. Um, just before I hand over to Catherine, the Dean, um, may I, on behalf of Cathy and the committee and myself, say a big thank you to you, Dean Catherine, for giving us this wonderful building in Newcastle when all else failed. I can tell you it's been very hard trying to find another venue. The pews might be hard, and the Dean said bring a cushion. I didn't see many cushions coming in, but there's much around to take your mind off that. Uh, we want to also have a special thank you to Robert Gummo. Robert, could you be upstanding? <laughs> Robert's our verger and he's our technical whiz. And during COVID times, this great building wasn't to be open, had to work under all sorts of conditions and he's kept it rolling with the, the live streaming. So we thank you for that, Robert. Now I'd now ask the Dean to welcome you and acknowledge country. I can't invite her because this is her patch actually. So please welcome the Dean, the Reverend Catherine Bowyer. Thank you very much, Judy. And it is an absolute delight to welcome you to the cathedral this evening. This cathedral is built on Awabakal land and the Awabakal people have cared for this land, this earth, this sky and this sea for time beyond our counting. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and pray that I with the cathedral community may join with them in caring for all that God has entrusted to us in the good gifts of creation. It is wonderful, as I said, to welcome you to the cathedral tonight. When Judy and Kathy approached me and asked would it be possible, my answer was yes, because as the cathedral we're custodians to so many treasures, fine art treasures, and it is wonderful to welcome you to a place which many of you know so intimately, but none more so probably than Julian himself, who has cared for this uh, place and its treasures since the time of the earthquake, and possibly before that, Julian, I'm not sure, uh, most notably recently in the incredible conservation project of the Birdwood flag. So it is good to welcome you tonight. I did recommend you bring cushions. Um, the seats are designed to keep your attention but I'm sure you won't have any issues with that because I'm looking forward to a fascinating evening. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Dean Catherine. Now to our distinguished guests. One of the great blessings of the pandemic has been we had to seek other people besides UK lecturers. So we had a great list of people. Amongst the Australian lecturers, you will see on your programs, there's quite an array of different people, some we haven't had before. And tonight is no exception to these great talented people. As the Dean's just mentioned, Julian's um, association with the cathedral goes right back to 1989. You must have been a very young man then, Julian. Um, and he was very much involved with the conservation and cleaning of work in Christchurch Cathedral. And he's also been involved with the Birdwood flag restoration. If you haven't had a look at that, have a little wander tonight. So it's very special having you back with us, Julian. We'd been told you do not lecture in normal times, but we took a punt and asked you. You replied without hesitation, I think I remember. Julian has done some extraordinary things in his life, and I will share just a few of them. 
Like many conservators, Julian came to conservation through a varied route, including a degree in theology from Oxford, a merchant bank, teaching at timber top, and clavichord making. He joined the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney as their first furniture conservator, and then founded ICS in 1987. This is now Australia's largest conservation practice operating out of Sydney, Canberra and Melbourne, and employing 36 people. Julian is currently the president of IIC, the International Institute for uh, Conservation. Just at the end of the lecture tonight, we thought because we can't mingle, some of you might like to ask some questions. So as we go through, you might keep those questions. And I think Julian will be happy to answer a few of those. Please welcome Julian Bickersteth. Thank you, Dean Catherine, and thank you, Judy, for that great welcome. Uh, it is indeed uh, a great pleasure to stand before you tonight in this building that I know and love so well. Um, I wear one other hat, which I do very proudly, which is actually president of ADFAS. And uh, this is an extraordinary organization of which you are a key part. And I've always loved this process of being able to talk about what I do professionally to it. Um, so what I'm going to do tonight is sort of have a sort of rather rambling uh, journey through some big issues on conservation, a number of which, as you'll see early on, I've not been involved with, but give, in a sense, the context to which I have um, spent my life to date, uh, namely the, uh, the material conservation of our, of our built heritage, our artistic heritage, our natural heritage. So lots of slides, lots of stories, and let's get going. So um, just check that I'm going to work this the, way, the right way around, and I do. So I mentioned natural heritage, and indeed we do and start with um, a key part of Aboriginal and natural heritage, uh, Uluru. Uluru, as you may know, um, was climbed upon extensively by tourists, um, and by the 1960s, a number of people had fallen off, and the tour operators at the time uh, convinced the government to allow them to create a chain and post um, support to allow people to hold on to it as they climbed it. And um, that stood in place uh, until the end of 2019, when uh, the Katajuta uh, National Park, in which it's part, uh, their board agreed to remove it and stop the climbing of Uluru. Um, and that has a long history to it in terms of uh, the process of how they came to reach that decision. The Anangu, uh, who are the local um, uh, First Nations people that, uh, uh, whose area it is, uh, had long campaigned for this and had asked people not to climb, but they did keep climbing. And indeed, in the last fortnight, uh, I think some enormous number, about 15,000 people climbed it. But no, long, no longer can you climb Uluru. And our task was um, to, if I push the right button, to remove this chain and post to allow Uluru to be returned to its pre-1960 state. And uh, there are 134 posts uh, with some very substantial chain that run up from the car park in the left-hand image that you can see um, up the, the steepest part of Uluru. And I'm sure a number of you may have climbed it. I must admit I did. I climbed it in 1982 uh, at a stage when I, I justified by saying it was not very clear that we were not being asked to do so, but um, it was entirely the right thing to close it. That's looking down from a high point where we put these A-frames with um, abseil uh, lines, basically, to ensure that uh, the workers themselves were carefully um, looking after and did not fall off as they removed the, the posts. So the posts had all been drilled into the rock, and our brief was to take it back to a stage whereby there was going to be no sign of the posts having been there. So um, originally we thought we'd wrench them out, break the bond with the concrete and pull them out, but that uh, didn't work. So uh, what we ended up doing was cutting them flush with the rock. 
uh, and then uh, drilling down uh, to remove the metal outside. You can see the concrete core. Um, I hope I'm looking at the right image. I am. Um, the concrete core of the, uh, uh, that was inside the post, which is why we couldn't begin to move them, and get them well below the surface. And then what we did, um, we thought we'd fill it with rock that came from Uluru. And uh, obviously, you can't just chip a bit off. Uh, whereupon the National Park said, we actually have a whole box of what we call sorry rocks. And these are rocks that tourists have taken away from the rock and returned, feeling guilty later. And um, it, it, uh, if, if we come back to Kevin Rudd's sorry apology to uh, First Nations people, uh, it was so appropriate that uh, we were going to use the sorry rocks to fill 134 holes, uh, which we successfully did. And uh, now um, that was one of the very last people that um, has been up Uluru, Uluru, now going down. And Uluru, after a, a tiny moment in its long life, is now returned to its untrampled state. Um, there was a white line, rather like a sort of middle of a road that went right up uh, for you to follow. But that's been repainted because it weathers quite fast previously. And so our view is, rather than trying to strip it, we'll let it weather off normally. And uh, all sign of any human interaction on top of Uluru has now gone. So um, the conservator's life is varied. And perhaps to set that in context, perhaps I'll move to a, um, a different form of conservation. This is the, the Daimler the Queen drove around the country in, uh, in her visit in 1954. Um, it ended up on a farm. And in fact, cats lived in the back. And I think a number of cat litters um, appeared at that stage. It now belongs to the National Museum uh, of Australia. And the concept, again, is how you talk about something that the Sovereign has used, which was once a very grand car, but has had a sad life since, one could say. Well, a progressively sad life. The cats probably said it was a happy life. Um, but uh, it now looks like this. And the key was to, in a sense, be able to tell its history, um, both up to and after its use by the Sovereign. And so in the end, we decided not to repolish it at all, but to leave it in that rather lovely state uh, in which it now sits in the National Museum in Canberra. Now, we've seen rock to conserve, we've seen metal to conserve. Um, there are very odd things we deal with. This, in fact, of course, is part of a, um, uh, of a, of a bee's um, nest. And um, what had happened is that a, um, a budding artist had put a frame inside a, a um, uh, a, a bee's hive and had asked them to populate, which they had done and created this extraordinary work of art. Now, in transporting that, part of it broke. And the question is, uh, from a conservative's point of view, what do we do to repair that? And somebody had the very clever idea that bees don't like seeing damage to their uh, constructions. Why not put it back in the hive? Which indeed was done, and the bees very carefully rebuilt all the bit that had been broken, which uh, is a, a natural form of trying to solve things. Um, uh, talking about strange materials, um, these are busts, which look as though they're made out of uh, uh, marble, of course, what they're imitating. Uh, in fact, the left one is made out of chocolate, and the right hand one's made out of soap. And the um, artist calls them lick and lather um, for obvious reasons. Um, now, um, chocolate indeed is something we've done uh, a fair bit with. This is a sculpture in Mona in, in uh, Hobart. And um, it had broken down its left-hand side uh, on transportation to Mona. And we were asked to repair it. And literally, we went down to Woolies and got about five different types of chocolate and mixed them up and uh, qu quietly repaired it. Um, you may look at it and think it's a rather beautiful thing. I'd have to tell you it's a perfectly hideous thing, because uh, what, in fact, it is is a, um, it's a mold of a suicide bomber who's blown herself up. So actually, what you see in front of you is most of her insides that have come out, so, th which is all part of, as you know, the theme of Mona, which is um, death and sex and a variety of other things. Um, so, however, we don't question uh, the artistic value of these things. We just do what we're told as conservators. 
Now, um, sometimes the tasks we take on board are fairly uh, major. This is not one I've been involved in, but uh, is a very beautiful Leonardo da Vinci cartoon um, uh, of uh, the mother and child uh, that somebody fired a shotgun at. In fact, they fired a shotgun at the plate glass window in front of it, which itself largely protected it, but uh, the shards of glass went through it and created the need for many um, hundreds of pieces of paper to be slowly rebuilt into the form in which uh, the area could be repaired. This actually was done, uh, it's, a, it's an old story, this, it must be in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, before of course computer mapping was around to sort of really work out how this went. So it was a tour de force big time, but um, said cartoon now resides in the National Gallery in London, uh, looking um, largely untouched. One of our sort of um, points of reference is that we'd like to th leave things with some indication of the work that has been done to them. So close up, you can still see that that area has been uh, repaired. Um, here's another one um, uh, uh, of a different form of conservation process. Uh, this is in a private house actually in the south of England and is by an artist called Henry Peake the Elder and depicts the Black Prince. Now, um, you will look at that image and see rather oddly the fleur-de-lis, the symbol of the uh, Prince of Wales, is, uh, is actually sort of hanging above the horse's head. And when conservators started exploring the fact that the tree behind appeared to be flaking a bit, they discovered a very different color underneath, which was not a ground, but in fact was a different painting. And in fact, um, the painting itself used to look like that. Um, which is a very beautiful painting um, with the most extraordinary headgear, as you can see, coming off his helmet. If I just go back one stage. But the critical bit is, first of all, the fleur de lis now makes sense. It's set a piece of stone in a wall. But the other thing is Father Death is um, uh, in the background stalking the Black Prince uh, because he died, as you probably know, at a very young age. And um, so, in fact, um, the process probably was painted out to look like that at a later stage where it was thought to be rather macabre. And uh, unfortunately, his hat gear went. Um, um, and so he just ends up with that rather jaunty hat, uh, but none of those extraordinary feathers coming from it. Those are the joys of conservation, which uh, um, reveal things you don't think you're always going to find. Sometimes they reveal surprises. This is a, a, a church in Spain, uh, which is always known to have um, a fertility tree in it. And uh, nobody was quite sure uh, why the fertility tree seemed to be rather bare uh, until the conservators got to hand and started cleaning where the leaves should be and discovered a lot of phalluses that had been hung from the tree itself, as you can see. Not quite, uh, well, of course, then the question is, what do you do? Do you keep going or do you cover them up again? But uh, anyway, the reason why the fertility tree was there uh, was indeed revealed. Now, sometimes conservators have their job taken over by others. And this is a very famous uh, painting, which you may know more about uh, as it's been a lot in the press. But uh, it's actually a 19th century fresco in a church in Borgia in Spain by an artist called Martinez. And um, a local parishioner, and I'm glad to be talking to you in a cathedral, so number one lesson, do not take this on board. A local parishioner decided that uh, echo homo, as uh, behold the man, which is what the image of Christ uh, depicts, uh, was looking rather um, sad. Indeed it was, as you can see, the paint was flaking, so they set to to repair it and um, uh, created the image on the side, which became known as Echo Mono, or Behold the Monkey. Um, now, uh, the, the most interesting issue of this is that it became such a sort of celebrity uh, process. And so um, there is uh, a, um, a sort of postcard which shows on the left the original, on the, in the middle what happened, and on the right what should have happened. Um, and the perpetrator of this, a famous perpetrator now is this woman called Cecilia Jimenez. And Cecilia thought, I think I can make a buck or two out of this. And so she um, actually embarked on a rather interesting merchandising route. And she created a whole range of merchandise uh, to sort of promote her work, which includes not only wine, but teddy bears and indeed mugs, all of which you could buy to celebrate what a botch up job she'd done. Um, but um, what in fact did uh, come from all of this is the church itself, which was 
a rather out of the way place, suddenly became a sort of pilgrimage site. And they thought, well, we need to charge people from that. And they have made thousands out of it. And of course, all the local hostelries and restaurants and things have delighted in it as well. So that's not quite the point, really, that you botch up a painting and make a lot of money out of it is uh, not really meant to be happening. But a man who has made a lot of money out of this process is uh, our good friend, the unknown scene, uh, Banksy. Banksy is known to be a Bristol artist, but nobody knows what he looks like, or those that do keep quiet about it, who famously um, draws um, paintings on walls and is continuing to do those, some very interesting uh, ones that he's created during COVID. And, um, but he's never seen. And this is a painting of his called um, Girl with a Balloon. I think a Girl with a Red Balloon. And it came up for sale at uh, Christie's in London. And was sold for $1.4 million. Gets you some idea of what you pay for a Banksy. And as the gavel went down, a rather horrifying th thing began to happen, namely that it started sliding out the bottom of its frame, shredding itself as it did so. And so, the, in fact, you can, can't really see there, but the bottom part of that image has been completely shredded. Um, and there it's jammed. Uh, in fact, what appears to be happening, it was a gimmick by Banksy himself, who was almost certainly in the uh, audience, who was controlling the um, shredder and decided, therefore, to leave it uh, half in, half out. And it apparently is now worth a great deal more than 1.4 million. Uh, so it shows that you, even gimmicks like this sometimes work for you. Um, the, the interesting thing is that Christie's obviously look at all their material that comes in. And um, typically, a painting like this, they'd take out of its frame and check all was well. But um, without. Um, and they employ conservators to do that. The conservators said, no, we were told very strictly that it wasn't to come out of its frame. Now, I think if you looked at this frame, you would have worked out there was a shredding machine in the bottom edge of it that you had, uh, with a slot, presumably, you would have thought, hmm, what's that doing there? So th th I think there's, there's a number of parties that were privy to this process, but uh, it's a good story. It's a good story. Now, let's just go to uh, perhaps the most interesting of, of all uh, paintings uh, in terms of value is uh, this amazing painting by uh, da Vinci, um, which is the most expensive painting in the world, bought for $450 million um, by um, that rather dreadful man, I can say in here, who's head of the uh, head of Saudi Arabia, MTS, what do they call him, Mohammed? Um, yeah, anyway, you know what I mean. Um, but um, he bought it and gave it immediately to his brother, who has it on his yacht, it is said to be. Um, a few things going on here. Um, perhaps the most interesting is that uh, it was very heavily conserved. Um, and um, uh, you can see the image on the right hand there of quite how much conservation had to, to be undertaken. And there is some question mark whether it's by da Vinci at all. But what is very clear is that it had a very big makeover. Um, and it was undertaken by a, a very well-respected conservator in New York called um, Angelo Mugostini. Um, and afterwards, Tom Campbell, who was at the time the director of the Met, said that her work is probably millimeter by millimeter the most valuable of any living artist, which, as you can see, once you start infilling the uh, areas of loss and you sell the whole painting for 450 million, uh, it does become pretty valuable. What is um, most interesting about it is that it was sold as having belonged to Charles II, sorry, Charles I. Um, and uh, as you may know, when the Civil War occurred and the Commonwealth came in, uh, Oliver Cromwell sold off the royal collection. And Charles II made a valiant effort to buy a lot of it back. But um, at that time, everything was sold off. And um, it is known that at the sale of um, the royal treasures, um, a Salvatore Mundi, described as a, um, uh, a Christ figure with orb in hand, was sold. And um, this is a similar image, as you can see. Um, this actually belongs to the Pushkin Museum in, uh, in Moscow. And critically, this is the critical piece of information, the um, back of all royal paintings were marked with the royal cipher, CR for Corollus Rex. And um, the Pushkin um, image does indeed have the CR and the crown upon it, as you can see on the left-hand side there. 
Um, the uh, Salvatore Mundi that the um, uh, Saudis own has that thing on the right, which in fact is a very elaborate structure to stop the wood splitting. And uh, Mugustini removed that and um, said there was nothing behind, uh, but it had to be uh, in place to hold the piece in place. So this all came out afterwards, and it does appear only one figure of Christ with orb was sold at the sale of uh, King Charles I's uh, treasures. So was it ever in the royal collection in the first place, which was part of why it was seen to be so valuable? Who knows? But um, at the moment, it sits uh, on board a yacht um, and cannot be further examined. Anyway, let's move to um, some more uh, local treasures. Um, and having talked around the world, this is actually a painting that we worked on, um, which has in a small way that rather lovely Henry Peake the Elder uh, discovery. Uh, this appeared to be a 19th century um, um, image of um, Joseph's coat being brought back to be shown to his devastated father, uh, with Reuben in the background with that rather nice sort of 18th century wig on. In fact, um, when we went digging, we discovered that uh, there was a whole layer of sky that had been put in later. And in the process, uh, the hairstyles had been heavily neatened up. So Reuben's hair, which looked like that uh, in the 19th century, actually when removed, looked like that. Um, uh, and it was actually a 16th century painting that have been completely overpainted in the 19th century, um, which was, and in, indeed, um, Isaac's haunted eyes, you can see, become much more powerful when we are able to remove the overpaint. So that's what, in a sense, restoration at one stage looked like at that period. It was very much an overpainting one. We do lots of work on paintings, and um, uh, we find all sorts of problems. This is by one of the Boyd family, Pen Penley Boyd, uh, an image of Port Hacking, very beautiful painting, but with a major problem that a lot of his paintings hit, whereby the paint flakes. This is generally due to the ground not being prepared properly, and so the adhesion's not very good, and when you get a lot of humidity and changing humidity, the paint starts flaking. But um, we put these things on what we call a hot table, which um, allows us to put a, a a surface of a, um, a coating of the top and then um, pull it down under vacuum um, to allow it to return to its former glory. Um, a very lovely painting. Um, another more interesting painting, uh, sorry, not more interesting, a different type of painting was this one, which um, um, I actually was asked to conserve by Zanana Guzmao, who was, as you know, the president and prime minister of Timor at various stages. And um, he explained to me exactly what it's about. It's actually a series of paintings called tunnel paintings, which he did. So he was running Fretlin, which was the um, uh, uh, independence organization fighting group in Timor, and was uh, captured and taken to Java and was imprisoned. And um, was um, sitting in a jail there in solitary confinement, and somebody came and asked him what he was going to do. And he said, I have a Bible, but nothing much else. And they said, well, you should learn to paint. He said, I don't know how to paint. So he was found um, the wherewithal to start painting and took to it in very big form and painted um, a great deal. And uh, in particular, he painted his wife, who, as you probably know, is an Australian called Kirsty Sword. Um, sadly, now they're separated, but um, she was uh, very much gunning for him and looking after him in, um, from afar. And he was in jail for nine years, and he painted a painting of her each year, but each year she was getting further away. It's a very sad, uh, in a sense, process. Um, so this was after year three, as you can see. Um, there she is, uh, and they're known as the tunnel paintings, and he painted nine of them. And it was our great privilege to uh, conserve them for him. They're now in the cultural center in uh, Dili, um, these uh, tunnel paintings. Um, painting is not always on canvas. It can be on uh, things, odd things like papier-mâché. This is a project I did many years ago when I was at the Powerhouse Museum. Um, and it is, it is papier-mâché at its very best, really. It's a whole suite which includes, unbelievably, a four-poster bed, uh, which, for the fact, papier-mâché is basically just chewed paper, is pretty impressive. Um, this one also has a lot of what we find with papier-mâché that was inlaid with mother of pearl and gilded and, of course, this beautiful painting painting. But um, this was a lovely one because we were able to remove the varnish and reveal this uh, very beautiful image of Fountain's Abbey in Mother of Pearl uh, on the back of the chair. 
And years later, I was in the Powerhouse Museum, which had stopped being terribly interested in decorative arts at that stage. And I saw it there on the racks in the storage area. I was very glad to see it. it's part of a pair, as you can see, which includes, as I said, the four-poster bed and many other things. But um, more broadly, what I've particularly enjoyed, I suppose, during my conservation life is, is thinking how you deal with collections and the context of how you conserve. And this is a very interesting property called Greenmount near Mackay in far north Queensland and owned by one family. Um, and they took on board, uh, built by them and owned by them. And um, when they died, it was bequeathed to the city, of, uh, the town of Greenmount and they keep it as a, as a house, um, as uh, a record of the family there and also of how they lived. And so it has the sort of traditional th things you see of a nursery uh, in various forms and the type of material you find in a nursery. It also has um, the sort of living in, in the country, which that's the sewing room and, and the medicine cupboard. And I always kick myself because behind the door was this enormous nail on which every piece of string that had tied any parcel that had come to Greenmount had been carefully applied for reuse. And so that was the whole process of recycling, uh, which the, the challenge, as always, was to how you conserve this without taking away this extraordinary uh, uh, story of one family living at Greenmount. And that that became particularly challenging once you got out into farm sheds, which for all you country people, I'm sure you can sympathize with. So there is, there is one of their Land Rovers, um, long since no longer operational. But how do you conserve that in situ in a shed that was partly falling down, covered in dirt, uh, without taking away its essential essence of how things are left uh, once they have reached the end of their useful life? But let's um, move from, in a sense, that, that um, country level to a, uh, a great icon, the Sydney Opera House. And we've been uh, lucky enough to do a lot of work on the movable elements of the Sydney Opera House. Um, this is uh, the Le Corbusier tapestry, which um, was commissioned by Utzon, but when he was sacked, he thought, well, blow this, I'm not going to leave them with that nice tapestry, which had not been delivered. So he took it um, home with him. Essentially, it was delivered to his house. It had not been paid for by the Opera House, so it was completely legitimate to do. And um, uh, it hung in his dining room for many years. And when he died, the Opera House was determined to buy it back, uh, which they did. And it is a very beautiful piece. There is some debate about whether it actually shows images of the Opera House, and in particular down the bottom where there's some, some sign of the, um, of the tram sheds, which used to sit on the point where the Opera House now is. But certainly Jan Utzon, um, Jorn's son, uh, told me they used to hide behind it during uh, pranks in the dining table to hide from their father. So it has that lovely sort of domestic overlay. Uh, on the front, it has a very domestic overlay, as we found, because there's a lot of food on it, which obviously had appeared while it was being used in the dining room. Um, but that was one of four tapestries that we've worked on the Opera House. And uh, the one which has given me, I suppose, the greatest pleasure are these extraordinary tapestries that uh, were commissioned by John Coburn for the opening of the Opera House in 1973. And he was commissioned uh, to create two, one called the Curtain of the Sun for the Opera Theatre and the other the Curtain of the Moon for the Playhouse. And they are an extraordinary story I'll tell you about some other day, perhaps. But essentially, literally within months of their unveiling and their acclaim, um, they were taken down because they were seen to clash with what was being um, seen on the stage of the Opera House and the Playhouse as well. And by the time that, they, and they went in and out of use during the 80s and early into the 90s. Uh, they got a bit burnt during some pyrotechnics on the stage. Um, they got filthy dirty from Greece. Um, and in the end, they actually started falling apart because they'd been sprayed in the New South Wales government's wisdom with a uh, uh, fire retardant, which was uh, extremely bad for the cotton warps. Um, so they were then restored very beautifully by the Australian Tapestry Workshop in in Melbourne, um, but then was seen to have no place in the Opera House. So when we got to them, they had been rolled up for 20 years. 
and um, uh, thank you very much to a whole variety of parties, uh, not least Adfest, which helped pay for um, opening up them on occasions. So they were uh, displayed in May 1919, when Adfest helped pay for them, and in May 1918. Um, to allow them to be seen in their original locations, but only for a day, sadly, because the mechanism which controlled them both is gone, and um, they are um, very beautiful, but very fragile things. The most lovely thing about um, the Curtain of the Sun is the sun itself has got a lot of gold thread in it, and as the sun, as the lights go down before the performance, the last thing that catches the light is the gold thread of the sun as it departs. So um, it's been a, a real privilege to be able to work on those. And there will be ongoing programs to get them more and more visible. And now something to something rather closer to all your hearts, which is the birdwood flag. Now, you may or may not know it, but the birdwood flag uh, sits in a cabinet over here. But when we first saw it, it sat in a box and looked like that. And uh, very briefly, it was an Australian flag uh, that was uh, created here in um, Australia, uh, sorry, in Newcastle, in Newcastle, critically, by Dora Sharp and presented to Lord Birdwood, who was the uh, General Birdwood, who was the commander, a Brit, a Brit, but a commander of the Australian forces on the Western Front, and was the first Australian flag to fly on the Western Front, and was presented back to the cathedral by uh, General Birdwood after the war. But being silk, it had progressively deteriorated, but was diligently collected in its various parts, and it was our great privilege through a wonderful uh, scheme of which um, we were glad to contribute to have it uh, conserved by us and then rehallowed and where it now sits back in the cathedral. But I've got here a little um, check that's working. It is. Um, how th th this is really how you get, take a jigsaw puzzle of a flag and turn it into something which we don't quite know what it looks like because the placement of the stars in particular was not quite where we would uh, expect them to have them placed. Um, it, is, uh, it, is a, it is a red background, not a blue background. Blue didn't actually become the official colour of the Australian black background until quite late in the 1950s, I think. Um, but, uh, of course, the Union Jack in the corner helped us, um, and then we worked away uh, at the double stitching around each of the um, uh, stars, which allowed us to locate those. Um, and there was lots of toing and froing that went over uh, a long period, as you can see. But finally, we reached a stage where we did have something that did resemble it. People say to us, was it really worth doing? Yes, it was really worth doing, because the essence of this flag is uh, very much the, uh, the detail of um, uh, all the shown bits. And so then, having done that, um, my colleague Sky Firth, who really led our team on this, carefully sewed each one of those pieces to a fine piece of gauze. And then that led in due course. And then we backed it so that we had the correct color coming through. And then it led to um, a wonderful moment when we were able to uh, re hallow it here in the cathedral in um, 2017. And it sits over here right now. We also actually um, conserved the Gallipoli flag, which is uh, another very important flag that sits in this uh, cathedral. Um, but. I am a furniture conservator by training, so it, and I find it, uh, I always revert to furniture when I possibly can. So I'm just going to whiz you through um, a few rather fun projects that we've been involved in. This is uh, a rather interesting cabinet that came to us from a, uh, a farm um, in the Lower Hunter. And um, we were able to, it, it had sat outside, which is why it looked so sad. Uh, in those days, we completely repolished it. We probably wouldn't go so far these days. Uh, but what's nice about it is not, it's not an ordinary cabinet. It is actually a, um, it's a mobile wash, wash table, uh, which has a, a box that sits above the tap in which you pour hot water, and then that beautiful brass tap and porcelain, and then a big tank in the base. And the towel rail on the side, as you can see, so you can hang your towel. Some things are not quite so easy to work out what they're for. Um, this actually has a lever you push down, a little flap on the bottom that opens up, as you can see. It's actually an early form of spittoon if you decide to uh, sit at the table and uh, have to aim fairly carefully, as you can imagine. Um, this actually uh, is a collection of furniture from Rice Hill, a very important house uh, in northwest Sydney. 
Uh, and this is one of a pair of washstands which came to us missing its top. It originally had a lid and also rather the worst for wear. Um, we spent ages trying to work out what the top form was and couldn't find uh, immediate answers, though we saw where the hinge marks was, were. And uh, then my wife actually inherited from her aunt this washstand. Um, and although it's got flaps, it otherwise tells us an almost identical piece, how the top worked in what we call a cleated fashion, so a, a board across and then two end cleats. And so we are in due course able to recreate the, the lids, and uh, there they are. From Rice Hill also came um, one of our fun stories, which is trying to find out how you get to the bottom of a piece of upholstery. So this uh, dining table came to us with a broken back rail, but as you can see, the upholstery was looking rather sad, so we thought we'd better take that off to uh, uh, clean that and put it back on. But when we did that, we discovered that there was another layer underneath. Not unusual that people do upholstery over that. Um, but uh, when we took that off, amazingly, there was another layer underneath that. Um, still with its braid around it, as you can see. So we took that off, and oh, amazingly, there was another layer under that as well. Um, and I kid you not, this is the same chair. And uh, so we took that off, and uh, sure enough, underneath that was another layer, and another layer. Um, so what an amazing piece of uh, upholstery history, apart from anything else, in terms of changing fashions at Rice Hill. Um, and under that was the calico we were trying to get to, which uh, was the base of it all. And uh, we were able to actually, we, we pulled that off and then uh, restored the back rail, which existed. We put it back on. Um, and those various histories, and um, we, we kept off and are now in the um, um, uh, Simpson Library uh, at the Historic Tr uh, Houses Trust um, as a record of the Rice Hill reupholstery story. Also from Rice Hill came this amazing table, which uh, is, in my view, the most important Australian table that still exists. It's incredibly wide and very long. And you can see again a rather sad end that's looking at you. This was because when this was replaced in 1856 um, by a later piece made by the um, Parliament House, um, furniture on Andrew Lenehan. Um, this table comes from the early 1820s. Um, uh, it was variously divided, and one end was put against the wall to allow it to be um, used for serving. One end went out into the porch and was eventually used to um, put flower arrangements on, um, and then it went out into the shed and was used for sharpening chainsaws on. So it doesn't help a table very much when it gets to that stage. And as you can see, the weathering could completely remove any finish. The other end, that image shows you how beautiful the cedar was. These are single planks of cedar. This is, um, we know by the early 1820s that um, the hunter had already been largely devoid, uh, denuded of fine cedar, but they must somehow have found some very large planks for it. So again, um, in this instance, we, we stuck it all together and we, we, we did uh, repolish the end, which is the near end, to allow it to read as one, um, but all the breaks and cracks and things of chainsaw use are still very much there. Um, this is another one, actually, of a similar story. This is the original pulpit for St. James's King Street in the city, uh, which is felt to be far too grand and not useful. So it was put up in the attic where it weathered to that level. And again, we had rather fun sort of recreating uh, the original form of this very substantial pulpit. Um, this is actually from the Newcastle Museum. I've put this in just because it shows the variety of material that conservators have to deal with. This is a mine rescue kit, which of course is very apt here. And it has all sorts of wonderful parts. It has a pump for pumping air down to the rescuer. And that, as you see, has wood, it has brass, um, it has leather, has metal. Then you have a rubber pipe down which the wind goes. Uh, then you have a rubber horn that you blow to provide advice to the blower as to how hard he needs to pump on a leather um, a belt and a metal um, uh, connector piece. And then, of course, you have this wonderful helmet, which is uh, made of silicon uh, in terms of the, of the visor and metal and cloth for, to wrap around you so that um, you can go exploring to recover the miners. But um, again, lots of different material that we have to be part of. 
sometimes we just have fun jobs of that, rather like the Birdford flag I put this in, which um, uh, is actually the remains of a rather beautiful set of deer from Frencham School in, in uh, Mittagong, which I'm told some rowdy girls broke one night. But those rowdy girls eventually um, uh, became mature mothers and chose to fund its restoration many years later, which we were lucky enough to do. And uh, we rebuilt it all in terms of its various components and uh, restored it to the very beautiful Harveston uh, pond in which it now sits in the middle of uh, Frencham School. We do lots of work on bronze. Here's uh, King Albert outside High Park Barracks. And in this instance, we remove the traffic pollution. And um, you can see how you get some corrosion, both green and brown. And you get a lot of black, which is heavy corrosion brought about by traffic. And with these, we, we actually blast them with, hot, with water to get it all off. And then we wax them so that you can see one side of his face has been waxed, which brings up the detail but also protects them. And we keep that color there. It's a critical thing with bronzes. You don't make them look like a sort of penny coin. You leave that lovely detail green there. And um, this is Prince Albert with this, this beautiful um, sculpture uh, with the Crystal Palace. He's holding on to the plans for it, which, uh, of course, he was so instrumental in creating in 1851. Just down the road is uh, a later descendant of Queen Victoria's, uh, King Edward VII, um, or his uh, son. Um, resplendent uh, outside the conservatorium. It's uh, actually by the same artist who did the Victoria Memorial outside Buckingham Palace, that great thing in the road. Uh, it's Australia's finest equestrian statue, and we've conserved him probably three times, I should think, uh, because the wax does get depleted, so we have to keep re-waxing. Um, Metal on furniture doesn't go very well, it tends to peel off, as you can see. And so one of the things we love doing is sticking, this is, this is called Boole furniture. Andre Charles Boole created this tortoiseshell and metal mix. And um, one of the interesting issues is always how far you, you do clean them, how far you restore them, um, because they were meant to look really glitzy like that. Um, and so in this instance, we made it glitzy. Um, here's another piece, um, which... Uh, comes uh, also from the 19th century um, and almost certainly was made by the, f the firm of Gillows in Lancaster, famous uh, furniture making. But on top of it, um, so we restored that same problem of brass inlaid, but on top of it, much more interestingly in many ways, is this very beautiful uh, earlier Italian Pietra Dura table. So this is, this is polished stone that has been made into this most beautiful picture. And the piece in the middle, that's all a picture, isn't it fantastic? Um, all made of inlaid stone. Um, even the basket work, which is chalcedon, the form of stone, has been made to look like that, with little moonstones in lapis lazuli all the way around. Um, so a very beautiful thing. Here is also another very beautiful thing. This is a, uh, a French commode, not a commode in the way that we tend to think of them in terms of a potty. Uh, a French commode is very much a two-drawer two chest of drawers. And um, the great thing about French furniture is that it's all labelled. English furniture is not labelled. We know what Chippendale made because of the bills that still exist at Nostal Priory and Harwood House and the various places he made furniture for. Uh, the French had to label their furniture. And this came in to us from New York, where it had been bought by an Australian client. Uh, very beautiful Japanese lacquer and, and ormolu. And it was reputed to be by a guy called Bernard von Reisenberg. And typically, um, they label their furniture underneath the, mar the marble top. So in it came, uh, and we admired it very much, and it's beautiful ormolu. And then I, um, my staff and I started looking for the marks. And after a lot of hunting, we did actually discover the mark. And bear with me, but in fact, it does say B, V, R, B. B, V, R, B for Bernard von Reisenberg. And the owner came in shortly afterwards, and, and we were married to all, and, said, and I said, of course, there's the signature. And he looked at it very hard, and he said, this was only reputed to be by Bernard von Reisenberg, and you've actually found its in, in, incontrovertible um, uh, attribution directly to him. So I thought I might get a tip for that, but uh, he did pay his bill promptly. <laughs> there we are. Uh, here's another signed piece of furniture, Australian. This is the earliest known piece of Australian furniture, uh, known as the Packer Cabinet, because um, in one of those drawers, um, it actually says on it, and again, I shall read for you, it says, um, 
It says, James Packer, Sydney, New South Wales, and a Prentice, 1815. So an incredibly important piece of furniture in that old government house in, uh, in the National Trust property in Parramatta. Um, what's interesting about that, uh, I must just tell you a story of that, because it has a rolled dial overlay. It was acquired by a, a wonderful dealer called John Hawkins, who's bought a lot of, and found a lot of very important bits of Australian furniture. And um, he found it in a shop in Windsor, and he was going around England collecting pieces and then consolidating into a container to bring to Australia, which used to happen a lot then. And he bought this and said, I'll, I'll arrange to have it picked up. And the dealer thought it had what we call barley twist legs, those sort of twirly legs. Um, and he thought they looked very ugly. So he said, I've got time in my hands. So he cut them off and put on the existing mahogany legs, which he said made it look far more elegant. And um, John was none of the wise and so it was shipped off, the, excuse me, shipped off to the container and came to Australia and he unpacked it. And he phoned him up and said, what have you done? What have you, you've, you've cut the legs off. And he said, oh yes, I've improved it. But he said, those were the original legs that uh, had been on the piece, that you can't go around just improving things. And now we've lost that essential Australian part of it, the bottom uh, of the legs. So there we are. Um, it uh, sits in that later form. Um, here also is a very important uh, pair of um, chairs made for Governor Macquarie. Um, the one on the right actually is the uh, Chancellor's chair at Macquarie University. The one on the left went to England where it became the Bishop's chair, appropriately, the cathedra. Um, in, uh, for, so you, sorry, you have, a, you have a throne in a cathedral for a bishop, but many parish churches have a bishop's chair in it for when the bishop comes. And this became the bishop's chair in St. Peter's Bexhill on Sea in Sussex. And so it has the, in fact, the coat of arms of the Chichester diocese in the back of it. Um, but uh, it has now come back and sits in St. James's King Street quite appropriately. Um, and the third of these chairs, there were three of them made, uh, sits in the Powerhouse Museum. Now, they are all made by the same hand, and I've had all three apart, which has been a lot of fun, because there was some um, issue of whether Governor Big, sorry, Commissioner Big, who was the, the big commission, basically destroyed Macquarie, uh, liked these chairs very much and ordered one for himself as well, but the same were made. So two Macquarie had made, and it's his coat of arms in, with the... Uh, uh, the dirk on the top there, and the third was made for Commissioner Big. Um, talking of the powerhouse, um, the one project I really enjoyed and was so lucky to work on at the powerhouse was what are called the Hope Chairs. And let me just, as we wrap up, tell you the story of the Hope Chairs, so, because it is an extraordinary story as well in terms of things that turn up in Australia. Uh, Thomas Hope was uh, a very wealthy man, the son of a, a bankers, and uh, he did the grand tour, um, Greece and Rome, and then went on to Egypt, which was just opening up at the time in about 18, but in fact, 1790s, he was in Egypt. Came back to his house in Duchess Street in London and created a series of interiors um, for the treasures he'd bought. Um, including um, Lady Hamilton's vases. Lady Hamilton, the mistress of Nelson, he bought her vase collection and put that in one of these rooms. And he created an Egyptian room, which is what you're looking at here. And he then wrote a book that was very important about interior decoration and household design, as it was called. So we know a lot about him and his style. And in that room, he showed, um, as you can see on the left and right against the walls, these rather interesting Egyptian chairs. And lo and behold, in 1984, my first year at the Powerhouse Museum, um, this chair turned up at Lawson's. And um, it had been out in Strathfield, where it had been uh, sitting in a shed. And it was just described as a black and gold chair in the Egyptian style. And the curator at the time, Anne Watson, said, I think these look like Hope style. And she researched it and discovered that after Hope's house was sold, the chairs disappeared. Two of them turned up in the London 1950s, but two had never been seen since. And here was one of these chairs, almost certainly turning up in, in um, Lawson's in town. Uh, the other one, there were two chairs that lost its arms completely. Um, so it was really in very poor condition. And the one that still did it to have its arm had an uh, enormous amount of wear. You can see there was a bolt that sort of went down through it that had been attached with a big wing nut to hold the whole thing together. They were riddled with woodworm. 
Um, and anyway, it was my job as uh, their furniture conservator to restore these beautiful chairs, uh, which was uh, a, a lot of fun. Uh, taking them apart and finding original wedges for the mortise and tenon chain, they'd never been very well made, uh, replacing component parts, but keeping the original gilding, um, replacing arms that were missing, um, of course, having to replace the bronzes that uh, two of these were missing. These are crouching priests under the arms. And um, here, here we are doing the lost wax process, making rubber molds and then making uh, new bronzes. And perhaps uh, equally interesting, the upholstery, which had a rather uninteresting yellow damask on. Um, from the descriptions of Hope in his book, we know that originally they were green. And um, so we went back to a factory um, in France that was using Jacquard looms, which is what Hope would have used. And they had their pattern books going back to 1750. So we got the 1804 pattern books and chose a pattern and a color, uh, which uh, Hope could himself have chosen. And uh, this very beautiful material um, was commissioned from them. And there is Anton Stratton, who was a master upholsterer that completely remade all the upholstery and the, uh, teased out the horse there to create these lovely chairs. And um, that's how they now sit um, in the Powerhouse Museum. Um, restored, restored. They are very much restored, not conserved. 30 years on, would we go so far? I, uh, uh, I think the jury's out on that. They are very grand chairs, and they needed to be shown in that form. But the, the uh, end point of that was that, in fact, if we just go back to that drawing, you can see in the middle there's also a chaise. And um, uh, we know one of those had been found and was sitting in this big house called Buscot Park. Um, and by Lord Farrington outside Oxford, you can see it in the middle there. But the other had never been seen. And um, off the back of this, it, out of the woodwork, uh, literally, uh, somebody said, I've got that. And so the powerhouse, after much negotiation, bought it, and we were able to restore that as well. And importantly, restore its original upholstery uh, in the form it should be. The, these lovely bronze lions were missing. Um, and we had to go um, cap in hand to Lord Farringdon to ask if we could take a mould from his. He was actually the... Um, uh, he was very rude, and he said, why would some museum in Sydney full of planes and cars have a hope chaise? Uh, but anyway, it, we managed to get enough people to say it is the second one. And um, uh, in fact, Margaret Thatcher, believe it or not, became involved because she came round the Powerhouse Museum at that time, and he was her treasurer. So anyway, we, we cast the, the, the lines, and... Um, uh, this very beautiful chaise now sits in the powerhouse. Uh, but I finish with another chaise, which is known as the Hamilton Inn Sofa. And I do this partly in tribute to my friend Gwen Hamilton, who's in the audience tonight, who was such an important part of the Burwood flag story. Um, this came out of Hamilton in the Midlands in, in um, uh, Tasmania in a very poor state. And you've seen many images tonight of badly weathered furniture. Why is it so important? It's so important because uh, Hobart was only formed in 1805, was founded in 1805. This, we think, is pre-1820. So by that time, it already the sophist very sophisticated furniture like this was appearing. Um, it is unnamed. We don't know who made it. Uh, but it's also got its original upholstery on. And this we took a much more conservative route on. And we very very much just with the finish. We didn't repolish. We just, we literally resolved, uh, sorry, uh, dissolved the shellac that was still sitting there and reworked it, allowed to get a bit of color into it. And it now sits um, with its original upholstery on it uh, in the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery. Um, a little corollary to that, that it sits very clearly on a plinth as an object. But about three years ago, a rather hulking young teenager thought, I think this is a piece of furniture that I can sit on, but not only sit on, I can throw myself upon it. And he threw himself upon it, whereupon one of the legs collapsed. Uh, but uh, it has been um, re restored to its form. So um, I could talk about lots of other things. I could talk about lots of work I've been doing in Antarctica, but that may have to work for another day. There's me outside Scott's hut in Antarctica. And uh, that is the end of tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, so much for bearing with me.
Thank you, Julian. Um, before I say anything more, I, I think I will open the floor up to a couple of questions, not too many, but we can't um, mingle afterwards and ask Julian lots of things. So if there are some of you who do have a question you'd like to ask him, now's your opportunity. Any questions? None. Oh, yes, there's one right down the back. I can't see who it is. Where is it? I, I'll repeat the question. Yes. This is an interesting question, so I'm looking forward to it. When does a conservator know when to stop? Yes, uh, I was thinking of things like, um, you know, when archaeologists were trying to find Pericles Athens and they found the Byzantine cities underneath, did they stop there or did they keep going? I'm quite sure that things like restoration of paintings, you'd have the same sorts of problems. Mm. Yeah, it looks a very good question. I, I think uh, from an archaeological point of view, um, it, 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 you got, got to take each job with its um, own context and understand um, whether you are trying to get back to the, the earliest form there and whether you can keep stages of it. I think the answer is we like to try and keep the history of the piece, not restore it back to its original state as always. So we like to show the, the, the way in which it's been used and treated or um, mistreated, which is where that beautiful table from Rice Hill comes in. You can very clearly see at one end that it's uh, just been um, had a very hard life, but you can read it as this magnificent original table as it sat in the Rice's dining room. So piece by piece, but don't always go back to the earliest form, I think is what we like to do. I mean, there's a nice motto, which is to do um, as much as necessary, as little as possible. Um, and I think it does guide where we're trying to come from. I think there was another question up the front here. Catherine, did you have a question? It's all right, Judy's coming. <laughs> Thank you, Julian. Uh, it's related in a way to the previous question. I was once reading about an artist who'd driven nails into a block of salt in the shape of a cross, and the idea of the artwork was that the salt and the nails would interact and disintegrate. And the question was, what would a conservator do in that situation? <laughs> so that's my question. What would a conservator do? <laughs> Uh, that has, and I use the words um, uh, guardedly in this place, but that has an inherent vice in it, in a sense that um, it, is, it is, whatever you're going to do, it is going to decay. And um, I, I, three weekends ago, I was called at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning to say, we need you tonight because we're pulling the explorer's tree out of Katoomba. Now, many of you may have deemed that road over the Great Western Highway, and on the left, just beyond Katooma, is the original Explorer's Tree, which Blackstone, Wentworth, and Lawson blazed as they went through, or did they? Um, but it has sat there getting more and more decrepit, um, and it has been filled with concrete many times. It has been burnt by arsonists. It's been burnt in a bushfire. Two cars have run into it. And all that's left is a concrete core with a few shards, rather like a pelmet of timber around the top held by a band. And um, because of all the rain we've been having, the minister decided, advised by sorry, start again, Blue Mountain City Council decided it was an eminent risk of falling into the road, and the minister decided it needed to come out. So uh, through that Saturday night, three weekends ago, uh, we removed it. But uh, it, it basically, I can tell you now, it disintegrated in the process. Now, my view, that was going to happen anyway. Um, it is organic, uh, it is naturally decaying, and just as your salt and, and uh, nails will decay. Uh, so many things around us will decay. Our job is to preserve for future generations as far as we can, uh, accepting the fact that we can never stabilize anything. I mean, conservators sometimes say that our great solution would put everything in an air-conditioned vault in the ground with no lights on at all. But it's, it misses the point, really, um, that we need access to all of this material to allow us to appreciate and learn from it. Any more? One more? No? Okay. 
Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight, Julie, and it's really been wonderful to have you here. Such a busy man. We're so delighted that you could come and join us. And I must say, uh, I had no idea how many, how varied your experience in conservation is. I knew about the Coburn tapestries, which of course are just beautiful. I knew about our own um, flag, the Birdwood flag, but I didn't know you conserved chocolate, I must say or beehives, um, but it was fascinating. And the one I did find really interesting was Uluru and the conservation there, and how ingenious that you could use the rocks, that the sorry rocks, to actually make it look as though the, the steel post hadn't been there. That was fantastic. So thank you again for joining us. It really has been wonderful. This is our first uh, evening lecture for the year, and it's been a wonderful start for the year. So thank you again, Julian. Um, I'll get you just to give him another round of applause. And now he has one more job. He's got to draw the raffle. There's a lovely book on Barbara Hep Hepworth, the sculptor in the studio. So could I ask you to draw that? What am I doing? Pulling out one? One, only one. And it is. And it is black F1. Is that a winner? Like that. <coughs> Okay, thank you. I'll give you the book after we're finished here. Um, just a couple of messages. Um, I think you all know we won the Art Society Marsh Award, um, which is our it's a community award, and it was for all the work we've done on um, School of Arts, um, church recording, and young arts. But I want to say a special thanks to Judy, who put the submission together. We wouldn't have won it without that, so thank you, Judy. And also to all of those people that have worked on church recording, the School of Arts and Young Arts. It wouldn't have happened if you hadn't have done the work. But it really is an honour for our society to actually win that international award. So thank you all. And um, I just want to point out to you, you will be getting more information about it, but next month is Bring a Guest Free Lecture. So think about who you can bring along. Now we're in the cathedral and restrictions are slowly being lifted. We will have more room. Um, now, the only other thing is I wanted to thank you all for coming and supporting us tonight. It is so nice to be back and having a face-to-face -face lecture. You know, the online lectures were great, but it's not the same. So thank you all for coming, and it's fantastic. And I want to thank the Dean again for allow us, allowing us to use this venue. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had a home to, to have this lecture tonight. So our next one will be on here. So think about who you can bring along and um, thank you all for coming tonight to, supporting, to support it and we'll see you in a month's time. Thank you.